We are on board the Aegean Odyssey. Its specialty is cruising the coastal waters of the Mediterranean. Classified as a mid-sized ship, it is able to visit ports that are too small for larger vessels, and in particular, able to navigate around the scenic islands of the Adriatic and Mediterranean. Located on the eastern shore of the Adriatic, Split is the second largest city in Croatia, and certainly one of the oldest. A popular tourist destination, the port of Split hosts about 4 million passengers annually, making it the third busiest port in the Mediterranean. It is also the transport hub linking numerous Adriatic islands. Originally founded as a small Greek colony about 400 years before Christ, it really started life when a very large and opulent palace was built some 700 years later. Today, parts of this Roman palace still line the streets of Split. When Emperor Diocletian shook up the Roman Empire in 305 AD, he had his retirement residence ready, right here. The city of Split, now under the protection of UNESCO since 1979, has been built in and around the remains of Emperor Diocletian's retirement home. This makes Split one of the most unique cities in the world. Diocletian's palace was an irregular rectangle of approximately 30 hectares, the same area as 23 soccer fields. And here our guide is explaining that the sea once covered the area where we are standing. The corner towers from the northern, western and eastern sides of the palace still stand. Diocletian combined the qualities of a luxurious villa with those of a military camp. Never expecting to be attacked from the sea, the south wall was never fortified, and it was where the emperor had his luxurious apartments, with windows overlooking the bay. Next to the street poster and imaginary painting of the villa is an intricate metal relief model of the old town. The complex was divided in half by an east-west road that linked the main east and west gates. Today, the wall around the northern gate is the best preserved. It is filled with apartments of local residents, and through this gate, visitors were once received more than 1,700 years ago. Extensively restored and missing the original statues from the alcoves, the gate still represents the magnificent structure the palace once was. In 305 AD, some 9,000 people lived behind these walls, Today, the palace is home to only about 3,000. The gate on the south side was much simpler in design and is thought to be originally the emperor's private access to the sea. Through this entrance, we enter the barrel vaulted substructure that was originally below Diocletian's private apartments. The World Monuments Fund has been working on a conservation project that includes the structural integrity of this part of the palace and restoring the stonework. As Split has built up in and around the palace, the dungeons have been turned over to a shopping mecca for tourists. These shops sell everything a tourist might need. Guidebooks, pamphlets, key rings, fridge magnets, locally made jewellery and many other touristy souvenirs. Most of the new houses built inside the palace grounds are constructed in the local limestone and few original ones have survived the many wars fought in and around the city. This ancient town is dominated by the magnificent 12th century bell tower. Its presence is felt along even the narrowest of streets rebuilt to its present form in the 17th century, 
It towers over what was originally Diocletian's optic and shaped mausoleum. 24 columns topped with Corinthian capitals encircle the mausoleum, restored and rebuilt after war damage. They look in pretty good condition after 1700 years. After Emperor Diocletian died in 311 AD, the villa was abandoned and fell into ruin. 300 years later, when nearby Salona, Diocletian's birthplace, was sacked by Abars and Slavs. Refugees from Salona fled to Diocletian's rundown palace and turned it into a fortified town. The peristyle is in the centre of the old city and was access to the imperial apartments. St Domnius Cathedral is on the left side. The baptistry, once known as the Temple of Jupiter, is at the far end. On the wall lays one of originally two black 15th century BC Egyptian sphinxes. These flank the entranceway to Diocletian's mausoleum. Construction of the bell tower started in the 12th century and took over 300 years. It was rebuilt in the 17th century and was extensively renovated in 1908, changing its shape to the one we see here. The entrance to the church, consecrated as the Cathedral of St. Domnius in the 7th century, is through two remarkable wooden doors. Carved in walnut and oak by a local artist in 1214, the 28 panels include scenes of the life of Christ in Byzantine style. The 14 panels on the left door illustrate the life of Christ from birth to resurrection. The 14 panels on the right hand side cover the Passion and the Rise. They are amongst the oldest works in the cathedral and are regarded as one of the best examples of romantic medieval wood sculpture. Diocletian's sarcophagus once stood here in the centre of the mausoleum, but there is no record as to what happened to it. Eight red granite decorative Corinthian pillars rise up along the walls, and above them, eight smaller ones. The cornice above depicts racing chariots and hunting scenes. The two figures are supposedly the Emperor Diocletian and his wife Prisca. The rest of the interior is filled with a mixture of Romanistic art and Gothic sculptures. To the right of the beautiful 13th century hexagonal pulpit is an altar dating from 1689 and dedicated to St. Omnius. Once interned here, his bones were moved to the carriage above the main altar in the 18th century. The baroque style high altar dates from 1767 and stands under an arch that leads from the cathedral to the choir. A pair of gilded angels supports a container or shrine surmounted by cherubs. This container is only supported on the hands of the angels. There are no other supports. The illustrations on each of the faces of the container are local saints, and it is said the bones of St. Domnius are interned. The tiny cathedral was extended in the 17th century with a rectangular room called the choir. The magnificent 13th century Romanesque wooden choir stalls seen here are the oldest in Dalmatia. The walls are adorned with tapestries showing biblical scenes in Romanistic style and the effigy over the altar of the Byzantine style Christ also dates from the 17th century. At the southern end of the peristyle is the vestibule, where subjects would wait to be admitted to the presence of Diocletian. The round, formerly domed building is still in almost original condition. Once called the Temple of Jupiter, with beautiful mosaics on its walls, it was gutted by Christians and renamed the Baptistry. On most days, visitors are entertained by groups of singers. The circular baptistry has some wonderful acoustics. Yeah, you know. 
Today, the narrow streets and alleys are split out of a tourist destination. The streets are filled with shops and local residents, and for tourists, a map of the maze of the alleyways is essential. Opposite the cathedral, a narrow alleyway leads to a temple built in Diocletian's time called the Temple of Esculapius. Esculapius was the Greek and Roman god of medicine. The cross-shaped 11th century baptismal font in the centre is dedicated to Tomislav, the first king of Croatia. Starting as the Duke of the Duchy of Croatia, he was crowned in 925 and ruled for about three years. On a rear pedestal is a skinny statue of St John the Baptist, a later Christian edition from around 1954. The semi-cylindrical roof was made from hand-carved stone blocks with well-preserved figures of Hercules and Apollo. If only the walls could talk. After occupation by the Romans came the Byzantine Empire, then the Venetians and for a short time in the 19th century, the Austrians. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was Italy, and after, the Yugoslavian Federation. Croatia gained independence from Yugoslavia in 1991, and after a shaky start, Split has now become a major tourist destination. We are heading back to the waterfront esplanade, joining the throngs of locals going about their daily routines. And a clown playing an accordion is always fascinating. The esplanade, called the Riva, is the place to stop for coffee with friends. It is definitely the place for the beautiful people to watch the passers-by and to be seen. It runs along the seawall of the palace and is where water once lapped Diocletian's luxury apartments. Today the shore of Split Bay is a beautifully landscaped area lined with palm trees, a place for exhausted tourists to relax. And for those that still have the energy, the Reva is the place to buy those last minute souvenirs before the short walk back to the docks and the cruise ship waiting to take us to our next exciting destination. <laughs> 